Kitco News special coverage of Freedom Fest is brought to you by I Trust Capital. You're watching Kitco News coming to you from Freedom Fest 2021 in Rapid City, South Dakota. I'm Michelle McCory. Thanks for watching. And joining me now is America's top tech futurist. George Gilder is a writer, investor, and economist. His 1981 book, Wealth and Poverty, was the most quoted book by Ronald Reagan and defined the economic revolution of his presidency. George is also the co-founder of the Discovery Institute and the COSM Conference, and he is here to discuss his latest book, Life After Google, The Fall of Big Data and the Rise of the Blockchain Economy. George, I'm very excited to be speaking with you today. Well, I'm excited to be here. <laughs> For those that don't know you, let's establish your credibility as a prophetic futurist, because in your previous book, published in 1990, Life After Television, the coming transformation of media and American life, you said the following about personal computers. The rise of the telecomputer or teleputer will utterly transform the way we do business, educate our children and spend our leisure time, and will imperil such large centralized top-down organizations as cable networks, phone companies, government bureaucracies, and multinational corporations. You said that in 1990, and then you beat that with a quote involving Microsoft that you said in 1992. Give us the quote. The quote is that the computer of the future, I told the Microsoft uh, conference, the computer of the future will be as portable as your watch, as personal as your wallet. It will recognize speech. It will navigate streets. It will collect your news and your mail. It just might not do windows. It'll do doors. It'll open doors to your future. And uh, that was sort of the heart of my teleputer theory. And still, they haven't adopted my term teleputer. And I'm waiting for some company to launch. Uh, this, the smartphone is a teleputer. The smartphone is indeed the teleputer. And, and you predicted that in 1992. So how were you able to come to that conclusion? Because I studied microchips. My first book on technology was called Microcosm, and it gave the history of the microchip. And I actually handed the first microchip to Ronald Reagan. I showed it to him, a 64K DRAM from Micron Technology of Idaho, and I told him that this microchip was going to transform the world, that it, uh, uh, that it was a fundamental change in the history of technology, and it would make possible his SDI, his uh, you know, strategic defense initiative, essentially anti-missile missiles that transformed the Cold War. So I've, I've been uh, predicting yeah. the future really based on my understanding of microchip physics, which I chose to study after writing Wealth and Poverty. Wealth and Poverty became a global bestseller. And, and so I said, I've done economics. I don't need to worry about economics anymore. Uh, it's technology that really matters. And the technology that was most important was the microchip because it was based on new physics. It was the first technology of quantum physics. And as we said, wealth and poverty quoted by Reagan. So the microchip was what you saw then as the technology of the future and the basis for many of your forecasts and predictions. What is the basis for your forecasts now? Well, the basis of my forecast now is the internet is a broken paradigm. It, it was launched without a ground state of security. The internet is a gigantic copying machine, and that's why these constant scandals of fake news and hate speech or whatever, it's, the internet is a copying machine. It has no ground state of facts and truths and, uh, and even transactions. And so I think, and uh, at the same time, there's a gigantic global scandal of money. To, and uh, uh, the biggest industry in the world economy today 
is currency trading. 11 big banks dominated it and they gained lots of profits from it. But uh, right. it's, it's, it's 70 t times all the trade in goods and services in the world. Seven trillion dollars a day of currency trading. And, and so there's a breakdown in the world monetary system. There's a breakdown in the world communication system. And the answer to both those global crises comes in one new technology which is almost as transformative as the microchip and is enabled by the microchip, and that's the blockchain. And uh, there are lots of different ideas for blockchains, but essentially uh, they take advantage of the incredible storage power that the microchip has unleashed to distribute uh, transactional records across the internet. And thus, uh, no single person or single power center can uh, double spend or right. defraud or, or change. These are, this is an immutable database, and that is a great new invention that uh, is going to transform the world economy. So blockchain transforms the world economy and linking back to one of the themes in your book, and that is money is time, tokenized money. time. Well, Link those concepts together for us in the context of cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin the, in particular. The, the theory of, the, of uh, life after capitalism, my book that I've following life after Google, it's also a theme of life after Google, is that wealth is essentially knowledge. Uh, the, as Thomas Sowell said, uh, the Neanderthal in his cave had all the natural resources we have today. All the difference between our age and the Stone Age is the growth of knowledge. And What's the growth of knowledge? It's learning. So learning curves are the most fundamental fact of capitalism. Uh, growth is learning. It's uh, with every doubling of total sales, costs drop by 20 to 30%. And uh, that's learning. But money, which is, the, is a measuring stick and uh, Measuring sticks all have to be based on something outside the system. If they're based on, uh, you know, commodity monies, really are uh, commodities are valued in money, which is valued in commodities, and you get one of these circular. Right. Um, but there's only been one money that's been based on anything outside the system. And that's been gold, because gold is essentially an expression of time. And time is what remains scarce when everything else grows abundant. How and that's why money is ultimately time, tokenized time. Explain very quickly how gold is an expression well, of gold, time. Gold has, uh, is the one element that uh, hasn't uh, changed it, the time to deliver an incremental unit in a thousand years. Uh, in other words, uh, a man with a pan, panning gold in a stream in the California gold rush could uh, deliver gold just, just in the same amount of time that a gigantic factory that costs millions of dollars and takes 10 uh, mine it then takes 10 years to build, can deliver gold today. In other words, the time to extract an incremental troy ounce of gold has not changed in perhaps a thousand years. Well, perhaps it has changed a little with advanced little, mining technology, but bit, still very not, time intensive. No, because uh, the more gold you uh, extract, the more diffuse and uh, remote are the tro uh, loads that you have to mine and so it it's it's become harder to mine incremental units of gold 
in proportion as the mining effort has expanded. So, so gold has been the one element that's peculiarly monetary and, uh, and like the ounce and the... So how does that link back to the concept of blockchain revolutionizing our economy and our paradigm and our monetary system? How do you take the concept of gold, the concept of money is time, yep. and the concept that blockchain is the technology of the future and fit them all together? Well, blockchain is going to establish a ground state for the internet and the global economy. That is a, an immutable database that can underlie uh, the development of new wealth and progress. It's, um, and it's uh, immutable as time. Uh, there are only 24 hours in a day. You can't change time. It's, uh, and it's equally distributed to all of us. Uh, it's the foundation for all measuring sticks, whether, and, uh, and uh, money is a measuring stick. And uh, the problem today, the crisis we face in the world economy is measure as money has become a magic wand for central banks. And uh, that has, results in continuous monetary crises and the wild extravagance of the global um, uh, currency exchange is the world's biggest. Um, but, but what we're going to do is establish a ground state for the world economy again, uh, which, which brings gold back into play as uh, s through uh, the expression of money as time. Is that the answer, a digital currency somehow linked to gold, backed by gold on the blockchain? Is that what you're advocating for? Yes, it, but it has to be done just right. And it has to, it's, it's, and it has to, it can't be uh, with a limited total issue. It has to recognize the new developments in time theory, which, uh, uh, and time prices are uh, critical to understand. They're the most important recent development in economics is called time prices. And uh, they uh, m measure the value of anything by the number of hours you have to work in order to buy it. And, uh, and that time price can applies through time in any country in the world in any date in history this that same measure of time applies and it obviates all inflation measures and purchasing power parities and currency trading and all these various ways that in this groundless economy we attempt to establish values and manipulate values. So money printing is really akin to stealing people's time. It really is. That's a good, well put. So I want to focus then on life after Google and some of the themes you touch on there because they are linked to this part of the conversation. And the point you make is that Google is not just a company, it's a system of the world. What's the premise there? Well, G Google really has been a great company, which has dominated our era. Uh, that it moved from search engines, which implied cloud computing and uh, data warehousing and uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, and even on with the knowledge that uh, all this is information they're processing and our genetic codes are equally information and in DNA. Uh, they also reach into biotech and medicine and uh, Google. Um, so the whole era today is sort of epitomized by Google's system of the world. And, but the 
problem is that Google's system of the world has no ground state. And, and that's why I believe that uh, the blockchain and related cryptographic discoveries, um, Hashgraph may be an important contributor that's a different kind of blockchain and um, uh, represents the roots of a new economy and a new system of the world. But back to old systems and Marxism, because you say that Google is neo-Marxist. Yeah, Explain neo, what you mean by that. The neo-Marxist, Marx's great error was to say that um, uh, the, the, the Industrial Revolution, the steam engine, the dark satanic mills, the uh, loom, all these developments of his era represented a kind of final thing, an eschaton. This is the ultimate technology. We've, we've discovered the secret of producing wealth. In the future, all focus will be on distributing wealth. And uh, Google is making the same error. It's in Google Marxism says that machine learning, AI, robotics, uh, uh, cloud computing, biotech, whatever, it is an ultimate thing. It's, it's a singularity, as uh, Google's director of technology, Ray Kurzweil, calls it, a singularity. And it's going to produce a machine mind that uh, eclipses human minds and, and uh, allows us all to retire to beaches while Larry Page and Sergey Brin fly off to nearby planets with Elon Musk in a winner-take-all universe. So and, and my view is that uh, AI makes you dumb, as Jaron Lanier says. It's, it's, it's a symbol system, and symbol systems can't think. They can shuffle symbols at gigahertz speed, uh, but ultimately, the map is not the territory, and you always need an interpretant between the map and the territory. And a map is a symbol system, but the real objects of the world are the territory, and you need human minds to interpret the map. And, and human minds are as, com one human m mind is as complex as its connectivity is the entire global internet. One human mind takes a zettabyte to map the connectome of a single human mind. It takes about a zettabyte to map the connectome of the global internet. So, and, uh, but the one human mind operates on 12 to 14 watts of power. The global internet takes gigawatts of, of power, maybe ultimately terawatts of power. So AI it's, is not a threat to the AI human is mind, not a is, is what AI I'm hearing you say. AI enhances human brains and thus allow, uh, people are not employed because they're unproductive. People are employed for their productivity. AI makes people more productive and thus more employable. And AI is, uh, is just another stage in the history of computer science. It's a wonderful advance. It's parallel processing that I called for back in microcosm. I said the future would be in parallel processing and that's what's, that's what's going on. The von Neumann, von Neumann serial processing is being replaced by massively parallel processing, which von Neumann also invented, but that's another. I have so many tangents and topics to go down. Well, George, one of the reasons we're able to uh, provide this content to our viewers for free is the free advertising revenue model, yes. which you say is inherently flawed and unsustainable. And you write, of all of Google's foundational principles, the zero price is apparently its most benign, yet it'll prove to be not only its most pernicious principle, but the fatal flaw that dooms Google itself. Yeah. 
Google, YouTube, free advertising. It's how we get so much of our content. Explain why it's the fatal flaw. Because when you think of it, the ads on the internet in general aren't really ads, are they? They're minuses. You don't want to see them. You miss them if you can most of the time. And, and ads that, and uh, the whole dream of Google search and AI and machine learning and all these things is to only give you ads that you want to see. And that's what I predicted in Life After Television in 1990, that in the future, you wouldn't see any ads you didn't want to see. And that's because you could have micropayments and you could uh, essentially charge uh, for uh, little services, for views or for, uh, in other words, because money could be rendered digitally through micropayments, you could um, support all these big projects with real payments that uh, reflect marketplace truths. And, and, that, and, and that's how entrepreneurs ultimately serve, serve the public and gain profits, is by giving people things they want when they want them. And Google is sealing themselves off from their ultimate customers by chiefly serving uh, these intermediary advertisers. And, and, and now there's a kind of rebellion against the fundamental principle behind Google, which was that it was gonna understand your wants and needs better than you do yourself, so that they would be able to, uh, to uh, target the ads in an absolutely personal way. And uh, people resent that now, and so that fundamental assumption means that advertisements won't get better. And so that it's, it's um, I think that we have to move to real markets and real payments in order to create a real future economy based on blockchains. So micropayments, micro subscriptions, micro services. And I guess we're yeah. seeing that trend because the content that- It's happening slowly, it's happening. I, I don't see any ads on YouTube. I, I pay my nine ninety five a month or whatever it is, and 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 get to look and at your program. Of course, without... you watch Kid Co News on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> but before I let you go on the concept of data cloud storage, yeah. you say that that is also nearing the end of its era, based on the premise of Bell's law. Quickly break that down well, for us. I, the Bell's law says every. 10 years, uh, technology improves between 100 and 1,000 fold, and it entails an entirely new architecture. And I'm saying that the new architecture is emerging, and it's, it's based on blockchains and distributed storage. And uh, today, I, I have a, one of my companies that I, I like called Lambda Labs, uh, produces Block, uh, produces whole data centers in a container. You know, the, the whole uh, progress of electronics ultimately triumphs to the extent that it uh, uh, captures the genius of human beings. And human beings are not all, human minds aren't all converged in some data center somewhere. Human minds are separate and distributed, and, and technology will ultimately mimic the distribution of human minds and thus um, magnify them and technology itself as we move into a new era. Like the decentralized benefits of blockchain. That's right. Yeah, that's it. Blockchain is the first fully decentralized a data system, and it's and that's what that's its genius. And the reason that decentralization succeeds is the same reason human minds and human cultures triumph through their decentralized distribution around the planet. Well, George, here's what I predict: 
I predict you and I will be continuing this conversation okay. at another time Love for to do it. the second part of this interview because so much more to break down with you. But thank you so much for your time and joining us on Kitco News at Freedom Fest. Thank you so much, George Gilder. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Kitco News special coverage of Freedom Fest is brought to you by I Trust Capital.